Okay, so today, let's dive deep into a genre that I think could be ripe for this kind of closer look. Huh. We're talking about socialist realism. Okay. And, you know, I think everyone, when they hear socialist realism, they probably think, like, girl meets tractor, right? Right. Like those very iconic images. And certainly that's part of it. But I'm hoping we can kind of go beyond that a little bit today. Yeah. And um, and explore what was really going on in this movement. And we're going to do that with uh, some source material, of course, as always. Of course. But before we jump into that, I want to just ask you, like, for anyone coming to this who's maybe a little bit less familiar, like, what makes socialist realism so interesting to study? Well, I mean, for one thing, it was such a dominant force for so long. I mean, we're talking about, like... 50 years, really, starting in the 1930s in yeah. Soviet Russia, where, you know, this was the style. It was the art of the state. It was what was being promoted. So it had this huge impact, not just on art itself, but on, like, visual culture, how people saw the world and how they saw themselves. And 50 years is a long time. A really long time. Think about all the changes that happen in just a decade in art. To have one style be so dominant for that long is pretty remarkable, I think. Yeah. Definitely. And the source material we're looking at today really emphasizes that kind of complete dominance. Like the art world, according to this, was pretty much reshaped almost overnight yeah. by the rise of the Soviet state. Yeah. And that had a huge impact, obviously, on the art that was being made. So I guess my question then is, like, how did we get there? What led to this really sudden and kind of radical shift in the art world? Well, you have to remember the context, right? This was a time of immense change in Russia. You had the rise of Stalin, the embrace of communism as this, you know, kind of all-encompassing ideology, and with it, this very deliberate rejection of anything that was seen as bourgeois or, like, tied to the old ways. They were a clean break from the past, at least in their minds. Exactly. And that included art, the avant-garde movement, which had been flourishing with its kind of, like, experimental and often abstract style. That was out. It was seen as too elitist, probably too. Too intellectual, too detached from the everyday lives of the working class, which, you know, in the Soviet Union was supposed to be the focus. Right, the proletariat. Exactly. So art, from their perspective, it needed to serve the state. It needed to inspire the masses. It needed to present a very particular image of Soviet life, you know, one that was all about progress and unity and, of course, the triumph of communism. And that's where socialist realism comes in. Precisely. It's like the art world was given a whole new set of rules to follow. It really was. And the text actually lays out some pretty specific guidelines. It's like a manifesto almost. Yeah. With like four key tenets, right? Yeah. Proletarian, typical, realistic, and partisan. This sounds a bit like a recipe, doesn't it? It does. But I guess that was kind of the point, to have this very clear, very defined set of criteria that artists had to adhere to. So let, let's break that down a bit, because I think those four words are really important to understanding how this whole thing works. Yeah. So when we say proletarian, typical, realistic, and partisan, like what does that actually translate to on the canvas? What are we looking for in these paintings? Well, proletarian basically meant that the art needed to glorify the working class to show them as the heroes of this new society. Mm. You know, think strong factory workers, farmers bringing in the harvest, mm. images that were meant to celebrate labor and the collective good. So subject matter is key here. Absolutely. And then typical, this one's a bit trickier, but it basically meant that the scenes being depicted, while they should be rooted in reality, they should also be idealized. Like you're showing everyday life, but maybe a slightly more perfect version of it. No poverty, no hardship. Everyone's kind of happily working together towards a common goal. Then you have realistic. And that doesn't just mean painting things exactly as they appear. It's more about clarity of message, I think. Avoiding ambiguity, abstraction. Right, because that could be open to interpretation. Exactly. It needs to be easily understood, easily digestible by the masses. And then finally, partisan. That one's pretty straightforward. Which basically means... The art needs to support the party line. Right, towing the party line. No subversive messages, no questioning of the ideology. It's about promoting the Soviet state, plain and simple. So it seems like there's a bit of a tightrope walk there for the artist. Right? Mm -hmm. Like, trying to balance, on the one hand, this need for realism. Yeah. For depicting things in a way that feels true to life. But then also having to make sure it fits within this very specific ideological framework. Yeah. And I wonder, were there artists who managed to, like, subvert those expectations? Or was it all very much, you know, following the rules? Well, that's where it gets interesting because you did have incredibly talented artists working within this system. Oh, yeah. 
people like Petrov Vodkin, known for his unique use of perspective and composition, or Brodsky, who could capture a scene from everyday Soviet life with such incredible detail and precision. And these artists, they were working within those constraints, but still managing to create something unique. They were, and that's what we're going to explore next. Okay, great. How they navigated those expectations and what their art can tell us about this fascinating period. It's really fascinating, right, to think about these artists having to like work within those very specific boundaries. And we mentioned a couple of them, like I'm looking at Plastoff, for instance. Yeah. His work seems to fit, you know, thematically, what we've been talking about, like mm. scenes of rural life and collected farms, that kind of thing. Yeah. But is there something more to it? Like what makes his work stand out, would you say? Well, you're right. Plastov, on the surface, he checks all the boxes. He's painting the subjects that were sanctioned by the state, right. celebrating the workers, the harvest, that kind of thing. Mm. But there's a depth to his work, a kind of human quality that I think goes beyond just, you know, fulfilling a commission. Yeah. When, when I look at some of his paintings, like haymaking, I'm thinking of, you can almost <laughs> feel the heat, mm. you know, and the exhaustion of the laborers, but also, like you said, a dignity. Yeah, exactly. It's not just propaganda. You can sense his empathy for these people and maybe even like a subtle commentary on the realities of life under this regime. It makes you wonder, like, what was he really trying to say with these images? Right. Was he a true believer? Was he skeptical? It's hard to know for sure, but that tension is what makes studying this period so compelling, you know? It is. And it also makes me think about something else the text touched on, which is that this focus on everyday life, it wasn't unique to Soviet art. I mean, there were similar trends happening in the West. Oh, absolutely. I mean... Socialist realism wasn't happening in a vacuum. Right. It was part of a larger conversation that was happening in art at the time. So what else was going on? Well, think about the rise of photography for yeah. one. Oh, right. Suddenly you didn't need to paint like Michelangelo to capture the world around you. Because you could just take a photo. Exactly. Mm -hmm. So artists everywhere, they were looking for new ways of seeing, new ways of representing reality. Mm -hmm. And that led to, you know, this interest in the everyday, the mundane even. Okay, so like, how does that play out? Like, who are we talking about here? Well, you've got the Impressionists, right? Painting scenes from Parisian life. Oh, right. The cafes, the streets. Exactly. Or the Ashkin School in America. They were all about those gritty urban scenes, yeah. the working class. So similar subject matter in some ways. Definitely. But, and this is key, the intention was different. Okay, how so? Well... Western artists, they had more freedom. You know, they could right. be more critical. They weren't necessarily trying to promote an ideology. Exactly. Whereas socialist realism, it always comes back to that, to serving the state, to promoting this idea of the new Soviet man. Right. We talked about that a bit earlier, but I think it's worth revisiting. Yeah, absolutely. Because that seems like a really important concept to unpack here. This new Soviet man, it wasn't just about like painting people in overalls, was it? No, it was about creating an ideal, this vision of the perfect citizen. Okay. Selfless, hardworking, utterly devoted to the collective good. And art was supposed to embody that, to inspire people to become this new Soviet man. Exactly. It was aspirational in a way, or at least that was the goal. It's almost like they were trying to like will this new reality into being through these images. Right. It's fascinating. And I guess that makes me wonder about the artists themselves. Like, did they fully buy into this vision or was there some part of them that like chafed against those expectations, those limitations? Well, it's hard to say for sure, right? We can't get inside their heads. But the text does mention something really interesting. These private works that many Soviet artists created. Yeah, they're secret art. Exactly. And that's telling, I think. It suggests that there was more going on beneath the surface. So what were these private works like? Were they a complete rejection of everything socialist realism stood for? It depended on the artist, really. Some of them, they used this as a space for pure experimentation. You know, like bold colors, abstract forms, things that would have been unthinkable in their public work. Others, they used it to explore more personal themes, love, loss, spirituality, even just like their own subjective experience of the world, which was, you know, very much discouraged in official Soviet art. Right, because it was all about the collective. Exactly. But in these private works, you see the individual emerge, the artist as like a thinking, feeling person, not just a mouthpiece for the state. That's so interesting. It's like they were living these double lives. In a way. In a sense, they were. Publicly conforming to the rules, churning out these idealized images of Soviet life. Right. 
but then privately, they're exploring these other sides of themselves, these other realities. And it makes you wonder what they would have created if they'd had complete freedom, doesn't it? It really does. And the text, it kind of touches on this, too, with that comparison to censorship under the czars. Like, this wasn't a new struggle for Russian artists. Not at all. They'd been grappling with these questions of censorship, of artistic freedom for generations. It speaks to, like, the enduring power of art, I think. Absolutely. This need to create, to express oneself, even in the face of oppression. Exactly. And that's something worth remembering, I think, as we look at this art today. It wasn't all just propaganda. There are real people behind these works with their own stories to tell. Absolutely. And those stories, they're often hidden in plain sight. Yeah. Like, we might look at a painting and just see, you know, girl meets tractor. But there's a whole other layer of meaning there if we know how to look for it. Right, like the brush strokes, the composition, the choice of colors, even the way a figure is positioned, all of that can tell us something about the artist and the world they were living in. It's like a secret language they were developing. In a way, it was. And that's the beauty of studying art, I think. It's about learning to decode those messages, to see beyond the surface and uncover those hidden stories. Well, I think that's a great place to leave it today. It's been a fascinating dive into the world of socialist realism. It really has. And I hope our listeners will, you know, take what we've discussed and apply it to their own encounters with art. Because as we've seen, there's often more to a painting than meets the eye. Definitely. And who knows, maybe you'll discover your own hidden stories along the way. Exactly. Thanks for joining me on this deep dive. My pleasure, as always.